Hello, and welcome back to Hawks Lab. This is going to be the third and final episode in the C64 Hello World program in C series. We'll wrap it up by looking at some comments that you guys made, and we'll try out the code on an Atari emulator, and we'll have a quick look at the generated assembly. So the first comment is from C.S. Bruce. He's talking about when I directly manipulated the memory address to change character set back to the uppercase. And he's saying you could also do a print with the hex value 8E. And that is a uh, C64 uh, control character. So that is completely true and that would be a lot easier and I just did not think of that at all. So it's a, it's a great suggestion. So we'll have a look at some control characters afterwards and we'll try it out and see if it works. So let's just start by looking into that comment by CS Bruce. This is where we reset the character set to the uppercase um, character set. And let's just uh, run our program and have a look. So it says hello world in upper and lower case. We exit the program and it goes back to the uppercase. So let's just remove that line. Let's do a quick recompile. And we'll try that again. And it stays in the in the lower case. So now let's try what he suggested and just use the uh, the print command to print a control character. Um, but actually first we have to have a look at the control characters themselves. So, a control character is one of 32 characters in the Petsky code used on the C64, which do not themselves cause any visible characters to appear on the screen, but has some influence on how or where subsequent characters are to be printed. So we have this list here of the control characters, and as we saw, I think it was, was 8E, yeah. Select the uppercase slash semi-graphics character set. So that's what we're going to try. So let's give that a go. Let's do print F. We'll do slash X 8E. Now if we compile that and give that a go. Let's see if it goes back to the uppercase character set. And it does. So that's a completely valid solution as well. Just for fun, I guess we could also just try something else. Let's try and see if we can change the text color to orange, maybe. So hex 81. Let's see if that works. Let's add that. Hex 80 is 81. Yeah. Compile. Works. Works just fine. So just a different way of doing it, but especially for the when changing colors, it's better to use the text color method because that is uh, platform independent for all the platforms that actually support changing the text color. So let's just leave that like that. We'll keep C.S. Bruce's uh, suggestion and all looks fine. So this is the next comment, and this is from This Is Really Me, and I I got this notification on my phone, I got it in the YouTube studio, I got it on my YouTube just normal page, where this is actually from, because the thing is, when I click on this notification, the comment just doesn't exist, and I was actually talking to, it was 8-Bit Show and Tell that brought it up on Twitter, that he has the same issues. And apparently a lot of other people do as well. So they comment on the videos, we get the notifications and the comments are just gone. Unless the user just deleted them, but it seems to be a bigger issue than that. I used the developer tools <laughs> to try and see as much as I could of this message in the notification, because you can see it cuts off a pair, but it shows a little bit more down there. So this is really me comments 
nicely done. I like how this alternated between the classic basic poke and the direct manipulation of the address. I might be getting ahead of things, but there's also the library poke. And he's completely right. I didn't even know that. There's a, there's a method we can call to easily do the same as the basic poke command, basically. Now that we know that, we could also try out this uh, poke command suggested by this is really me. So let's go into the cc65 function reference and do a search for poke. You see that we have a peak poke dot h, and there we go, poke. Write a byte to memory. That's basically what we want. So it just takes an address and it takes the value we want to, to write. Let's just give that a go. Um, so that's available in peak poke h. So we would have to include that. Peak poke h. There we go. And I guess. <laughs> Sorry, CS Bruce, but we'll, uh, we'll swap out your code again here. So we'll do poke and we'll do 0xd18 and we'll add the value 14, just like we did up here. So recompile, restart, and let's see if that works. And it certainly does. So there we go. It's just multiple ways of doing the same thing. But this is uh, this is a lot more readable than the, the the casting to pointers and stuff like that in C. But you know, it's just uh, it's just a different way of doing it. I guess we can keep both. Just so I don't want to favor any of my viewers. CS Bruce also says that he would like to see a disassembly of the compiled code, and he's definitely not alone. I've had a few comments about that. So, as Joseph says here, we can use the dash "-s", option to generate the CC, well, the CA65 uh, assembly language file. So, we can definitely try that out and have a look at how that looks. And dash "-t", will also include the C code as comments in the assembly listing. So that would be that would be useful. So let's uh, let's have a look at that. So we can try what the comment said, uh, which was to add slash s to get an assembly listing and slash t to include the C source as comments. And that generates our assembly listing. And we can have a look at that. And I'm by no means very good at assembly, so maybe I say something stupid, we'll see. So if we scroll down a little bit, we can see that we initialize our variables here. The ones we had there. So they're just uh, defined here, I guess and set to zero and we have uh, one more label that's been created here and that is our string it's actually our two strings in the program so there's our control characters which is uh, this string slash x8e and the other one must be the hello world string so that's what we see here. That's just the data. So H E L L O and 20 as a space. So that's hello world. And let's continue down. Um, there we go. So we can see that the next thing we do inside, we're now inside main. This is the, the main procedure. And the next thing we do is clear the screen. So that just jumps to the clear screen subroutine. And this is where the assembly listing is not that interesting um, when you're using these methods, because that just calls into the CC65 platform runtime. And I'm sure we could look at that as well, but I think that would be out of the scope of this uh, simple tutorial. 
Um, when we set the background color, it's the same thing. It loads zero, which is color black. It loads that into the A register. It jumps to the BG color subroutine. Um, and then it stores A into our BG color variable because when the BG color jump subroutine runs, it saves the previous background color in the A register. So by storing the A register into our variable, we keep that value. And it's the same thing for border and text. And this is the printf hello world assembly listing. And it loads the start of the string, I guess, into the A register and the end of the string into the X register. And then it jumps to a subroutine push AX. I'm not quite sure what it does. I guess it loads the string somewhere maybe and load the Y register. Isn't that an immediate value? Two, not even sure what that means. And then it just jumps to the, the C65 runtime printf function again. So again, not very interesting. Um, same thing for C get C. Same thing again for a clear screen. And this is also the same. Uh, this one we, re we reset the colors. So now we load the A register with the previous color and jump to the background color subroutine. And this time we don't care about the previous value. So it doesn't set the previous value back into these uh, variables, so that's why we don't have store A to our uh, variables afterwards like we had in the beginning. I think that's enough assembly for this video, so sorry if you want to see more, but we'll close that down. And we'll instead do a final improvement to our Hello World program, and then we'll uh, try it out on some other platform afterwards and see if we have to do any changes to make it run on, uh, on an Atari emulator as well as the C64. Let's make this Hello World program a little bit more interesting. So instead of just printing out this whole this whole um, string uh, in one go, we'll loop over the string and print each character one by one just to make a nice typewriter kind of effect. So let's start by defining our text that we want to print up here. So let's do char and let's just call that text, I guess. Hello world. Like that. And now we could, of course, just do text in there. That should work fine. And it did. Um, now let's also define our the text the length because we're going to need that when we're going to use a loop to iterate over every character in the string. So let's do size t text len, I guess. And we can also just define our. Um, um, variable that we use in our for loop to increment the index. So we'll use i for that and just set that to zero as well. So we do text len equals string len of text. So that should give us the length of our text uh, in this uh, variable text len. And we'll do a for loop so we have we'll do that because we have whoops multiple uh, cursories we have already defined i and that is actually a limitation in cc65 that we have to define those variables beforehand you can't define that inside uh, as far as i know so that's why we define it up here and we want to iterate from zero to the length of our text, which is text len. 
and we increment by one every time. So instead of print f and printing the whole string, we use the opposite of c get c. We use c put c, which I guess we can have a look at in the function reference. Output a character direct directly to the console. So we'll just call c put c and we'll give it one character at a time. So we'll take our string and we'll just index into that with i. And that should basically do it. So let's remove print f. So we store our text length, we iterate over the whole length and we put every character to the to the screen. Let's see if this compiles. It did not. Undefined function string len. That is because we need to include uh, what is it? Is it string? Yep. Let's try that. And there we go. But that obviously does it instantly. Well, very fast anyway. Because this loop runs so fast, we don't really see each character being written to the screen. So we need to do something to, to be able to see that. And there's a sleep function that we can use. So if we do sleep one, it will sleep one second for every iteration. So every time it prints eight characters, it will sleep for one second before it continues. And we need to import that as well. That is in, uh, is that in U and I, STD? Sleep for a specified amount of time. And that is indeed defined in uni standard dot age. So we have correctly included that and we should now be able to compile. Let's try this one more time. And there we go. That looks a little bit more typewritey. It's kind of weird that it waits a second for the space as well, I think. So maybe we should just skip waiting if it prints a, uh, a space. Should be easy enough. So if we do if if text i um, is not like space, then we sleep. So for everything other than the space character, uh, we sleep. Let's try that again. L L. Oh, yeah, so only slept for one second there. Um, I think that looks more natural. Yeah, good. We can change this string to anything we want because we make sure to check the length of the string. So that should work fine. So we can then do please like and subscribe instead. Like that. And let's see. It's gonna take a few seconds to, to write that out. But that does seem to work fine. This white and black is looking a little bit uh, boring, I think. So let's try and uh, have some fun with some colors. So I guess for every character we could just change the um, the text color so let's just do text color and if we have a look at the definitions for the colors let's make sure we look at c64 we know that there are 16 colors so they go from 0 to f 0 to 15 which is 16 colors so let's just use i let's just set the text color based on the the value in in i let's see what that does there's our first issue can't see our p because uh 
text color zero is black, which is the same as our background. So that's not optimal. Please like and subscribe. So to fix that, we can just make sure that we always have, we always start at one and then increase. That should fix the, the issue with the black P. So the P should then be, be white. And there we go. But now we're gonna have an issue when we roll over to the first color again and <laughs> we're actually kind of lucky there because that is the the uh, space so I guess that actually works please like and subscribe let's just remove all the let's just add underscore section so we can see how this would look And there we go. We can see that we can't see that one underscore. So we would like that to be, when it rolls over back to white, we want it to skip uh, black again. So to do that, we can just do I mod 15. And then add the extra one to Make sure we never go to zero. And there we go. That works fine now. Nice. All right, let's go back to hello world. So I think that should be our final program and we'll try and see if we can run this on another platform than the C64. And I just downloaded an Atari emulator, which I should be able to run. There we go. So let's try build for, I, have, I don't know anything about Ataris, <laughs> but let's just try and build for, uh, build for this platform and see if we can run the program. To see a list of the uh, supported targets for CL65 or CC65, you can just do CL65 dash dash list targets, I believe. Yeah. So when we look at Atari, we can see Atari, Atari 2600, 5200, and Atari XL. I'm going to use the Atari XL target for this because I know it works. So we'll go to CL65 and we'll add dash T to specify the target and we'll add Atari XL and we'll just compile that out to hello and we can see that we get a few warnings and that is on line 30 and 42 and it says warning statement has no effect and that is when we run the, the text color So, 42, yeah. Why does it not complain about the first one? It's kind of strange, I guess. Is that because it's color white? Color red? No. It's because we saved the rival? I guess it is. Doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so <laughs> so there is definitely something different about this platform uh, when it comes to text color. I guess it can't even show colors. So we'll we'll see what happens. But 
Anyway, that's just a just, that's just a warning. So we did compile. We were able to compile. And if I choose C64, we can see that we can also still compile for the C64. So the exact same program can compile for two different platforms. So I'll do Atari XL and I'll run the emulator with the hello file. And there we go. Runs just fine. It types out hello world, just like we would expect, but with no colors. So it's just always white. It's pretty neat. Um, we could also do, just for fun, we could do, um, we can use some compiler directives. So if, if defined uh, underscore underscore Atari, I think. We'll do an end if there. We can do text hello Atari. And we can just do what's that else? Like that. Other words is uh, otherwise it's just hello world. See that works. No builders. So now that says hello Atari. So that's how you could also if you did have to change something about the program, you could check which target we are compiling against using these um, these defines. So that's pretty neat. Now I can take the exact same program, to just change that to Hello C64, and I'll compile again, but for the C64 this time, and I'll add PRG there. And if I open that in the C64 emulator, and I run the Atari, we should see two different uh, strings. Hello C64, hello Atari. So I think that's pretty cool. So this will be the end of this uh, series. I think three episodes of a <laughs> Hello World program is enough. But I think we, we covered some decent amount of stuff, I guess, for the CC65 compiler. And um, I'm excited to make more cool programs for, well, in my case, mostly the C64, but should be easy to port it to other systems, maybe. It all depends. It all depends on what you make. Like, if you use a lot of platform-specific stuff, then it's not very easy, easily portable. But I'm definitely going to use CC65 more and I will make more videos where I make some more interesting stuff. And uh, this is just the start. So thank you very much for following the series and uh, I appreciate all the support. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.